All right. Um, we can go ahead and start. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, many advances uh, this decade in AI, and uh, but most of the but most of the applications nowadays are focused on predictions, focused on computer uh, vision, focused on regression models, focused on uh, we identify some kind of, have some kind of recognition from images or any type of data. But today we're going to talk about something that's a little different. So we're going to talk about how this machine learning and AI uh, combination can actually make a robot act intelligently or learn intelligently more like a human. And today's topic will be. Uh, we want to find uh, intelligent behavior, and we want to find them using robots and machine learning. Uh, this is uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Beaton, and uh, I'm working at Intelligent Dynamics Lab, and I work on robots and machine learning algorithms. And I think it's really exciting to see everything that we have created and things we will create in the future. So these two are uh, my research advisors, uh, Professor Alex Tyler and Professor Roy Fox. Uh, Alex uh, mainly works on uh, deep learning, graphical models. And Roy, uh, who is uh, my actual uh, honors uh, advisor, and he works on uh, robotics control, reinforcement learning, and uh, he was uh, mainly leading for all the projects that I've been working on for the past two years. Um, I just really want to, uh, before we talk about everything, we, I want to focus on, and I want to address that, uh, the goal of creating AI is to fundamentally change the way we live and change the way uh, to improve our society and the life of humans. And we want to improve the productivity and nowadays, many different uh, issues, problems that you see around the world, those problems that seem very uh, difficult, seem very hard to solve, but fundamentally, there are some limiting factors that is limiting the pr production productivity and the progression of uh, human society. We have uh, vaccine shortages, we have mass shortages, and we have people in Africa don't have access to water, don't have access to basic sanitization and basic health care. And we want to improve that by leveling up the level of productivity that we have. And we want to automate all dangerous, tedious, and boring jobs that, that currently a human have to go through, have to work on, because we uh, don't have anything else to do, because we can't do anything else. So it's kind of sad that we have this situation now, but it's also very exciting that we can improve this uh, situation. So I want to show by talking about robots, we already have robots and don't get me wrong, and the robots now helping us every, uh, any, uh, every details of human life. And, uh, but the robots right now, are kind of having uh, something that we want, but it's not happening right now. And let me show you some uh, videos. So, try to notice what is different from. see the differences. Yeah, the robot on the left looks much more, I guess, quote unquote, advanced because it's like, like, like there's like a, like on the right, it's like very subjective. Like there's like not really a given set task that I have to do. It's kind of like scanning area and insert something dirty. 
yeah, it's it's a really complex uh, environment, and here to the depth, we have strange, very constrained environments, and the robots can already do a great job just by having to execute, having to execute all pre-programmed uh, instructions, and don't need to have a complex behavior that we understand about actual scene that you can see scatter all around toys and uh, sofas and the tables. We don't have to understand all that, but we want the robot to do what I put on the right. Okay, so I'm showing you the rollout on the right, but which, which means we don't we already have robots that can do this, right? Why am I showing it? Why am I showing you all that? The punchline is actually everything you see here is actually what you see. However, the robot on the right is entirely remotely controlled by you. And it's able to complete all these tasks. The robot capably, physically capable to accomplish all these tasks, but without the brain, it's, it's unable to do that. So we don't have those kind of robots right now in our home. So I think it's like a very uh, nerdy pseudocode on the left. That's the Tesla uh, production uh, code. And but on the right, if you're trying to program the robot to do whatever's on the right without remote, remotely controlling it from uh, using a human, um, how would you program that? It's kind of complicated, right? Um, and right, so if I want to fetch a cup of water, code the robot to fetch a cup of water to Agitash, uh, how would I locate the water? Uh, you know, we already have uh, we already have uh, methods that can like have a three D con construction using lidar uh, of the, the three dimensional scenes of the surroundings, and then. Plan through the actions, uh, plan the actions through the model as constructed uh, three dimensionally, and then grab that and uh, execute whatever instruction that's uh, using plan. But things get a little complicated when whatever, what if you, you don't see the cup? What if the cup is hidden somewhere? What if you want to absolutely go out and then try to? open up the drawers, open up uh, different uh, things, and then look into the sink, try to find whatever the cup is. It's a task that requires some kind of intelligence in, instead of just hard code, uh, hard code programming. And, and can machines think and act intelligently? And by asking this question, I want to define some things. What is intelligence? So one may say the robot needs to internalize or understand whatever things they see. And then by doing it, maybe something, uh, doing it first be wrong, and then next time you get it right. Or maybe uh, he, uh, uh, the robot observes something that uh, other people are doing, and then it's able to come up with a kind of uh, rough, maybe a rough side set of actions to uh, try to do that, maybe fail, and then try it again, and uh, try to learn these things. And the second is, after it understands, okay, what's the surrounding of the world? Was the cup? Was the uh, the table? The sofa? It needs to plan a sequence of actions to achieve some goal. Maybe the goal is fetch water to Raditash, and that's a simplistic goal. But there can there can be many different goals. So that's. Yeah, something more than just pre-programmed notions. And actually, the intelligent robots already have, we already have intelligent robots, and it's actually just silently coming into our lives. Uh, people are working on it. This is NAP, a robot developed by uh, Covariant AI. And you can see the difference between this robotic motion from the Tesla one is that this one actually have like 
different textures of items, different textures of classes, all the kind of different stuff. It's definitely a little messier, more messier than the Tesla version. And the robot needs to identify what that object is and figure out what is the best way to pick up that object and then put it in the right shipping container so that it can ship the way to the customer. And this is uh, just uh, two years ago and it's pretty exciting. And we have, and today, what I'm gonna talk about is how do we make this thing work, right? So we have a program and then it wants to take in some kind of inputs, uh, sensory, raw sensory inputs, maybe a camera, maybe a LiDAR 3D, although it's really not needed, uh, to translate that, have, have a program that's in between, and then it takes in that input, it outputs all the lower detail, uh, all the motor rotation angles to have this, to have the, all the arm move together to accomplish this task. And yeah, let's talk about how to make this thing work. So uh, this is the, a, a rough schedule of today's uh, uh, materials. And uh, can I get a quick idea of how many of us worked with uh, neural nets? And I, I, I played with uh, handwritten digits. Uh, okay. And uh, how, how much, how many people do we have of? Uh, uh, understand by uh, calculus, uh, derivative. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you know, uh, today's talk, you, you don't really need to understand all that. I can get to the key idea without showing you all the uh, messy math and details. We're going to focus on the big ideas today. What is what is this? Copy. Yeah, it's so easy, right? You just look at it and it's a copy <laughs> line. Right? But, but why am you showing it? Show, why, why am I showing you about that? Because when the computer looks at it, it takes a picture and then it goes into this bunch of numbers in the matrix or like store somewhere in your memory. And then the computer needs to understand what that is. It's a mug. Because if it doesn't understand that, you cannot execute all the other uh, downstream tasks. Like I need to bring this copy mod to any test. That's impossible because if you don't understand what a copy mod is, you you will not be able to go to that, go go there and fetch the copy mod. That's like a prerequisite, right? And how do we from this pixel intensity? We can figure out what that thing is in the picture. This is computer vision. We, in computer vision, we deal with these problems. And nowadays, people are using machine learning to deal with these problems. It's really hard for people to write program that can read in all, all those numbers and then tell you. So, you know, engineers from the 90s and 80s, they will actually program a piece of program that can say, okay, maybe like this number is like, three smaller than this number, and then this number is like smaller than this number. And then I look at maybe this role and then I find this number is the biggest. So it's a copy mod. People try that and it doesn't work. So it's, we really need something else to make it work, to, to make the machine really understand that that's a copy mod. We live in a world that's like this. It's much more complex than the copy mod. And we want to understand how to understand the copy mod first. So this, this is kind of more uh, complex than the assembly line, right? Uh, so, so that comes the image net challenge. Um, I think we need to control it. It's turning back. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, there's a challenge that started in Stanford University. Uh, they challenge people to use a set of image and 
all those images are labeled, and then they want to make the, uh, they want the, uh, people to program a piece of program to take in that image to, and predict whatever is the thing that's inside of the picture. For example, here, so, yeah, so the leopard is actually predicted correctly, and uh, this is predicted correctly, but um, this is kind of, um, and they want people to take in those numbers and then output some kind of prediction. And it's kind of hard for a hard coded program to do that. And then is it really possible to understand all that complex scene as a human do? So we did it. Um, so uh, more specifically, Professor Jeffrey Hinton in University of Toronto in 20, 2012 actually was able to cut the error rate from so what you have seen there on the top about 27 percent of error rate that was traditional computer vision traditional hard code programs that takes in those numbers and then predict what whatever is inside of that picture and then suddenly professor Hinton say okay um maybe we want to train a neural network to let it understand the picture for us. And then whatever is in that image is like something that we just cannot enumerate all the different possibilities that's inside of this complex world that we live in. So maybe we want to have, we want to have some machine learning algorithm to learn what's inside of that image and then have the ability to generalize to all the on-scene environments. And that's what he did. And it cut the error rate by half. After that, people started using uh, neural networks. And this competition, very unfortunately, but also like very lovely uh, for humans, it quickly retires because it, the machine is just by a couple of years, the machine is quickly able to overtake human performance in uh, recognizing whatever it, object is in that image. So that's amazing. Machine learning is really just learn from whatever is in the input and to uh, modify its uh, predictions to fit the output. And uh, we, we have many different kinds of applications today, uh, image recognitions. Uh, now, uh, I think uh, many people are kind of uh, bothered by uh, YouTube uh, recommendation system, right? Uh, uh, it's kind of understand what is the video that you like to watch and then it recommends to you and then yeah the, the time just goes away right yeah uh that so that's quite effective at uh at making you uh, love what they're doing what the, their product right so and so so as to amazon and netflix so why so by starting to think about how to build this program uh maybe we want to look at how humans understand whatever is in the mug. So when you look at the mug, the mug is an array of uh, lights, and then it hits your retina, and then it travels all the way back to your brain, somewhere over here, that's where the primary uh, visual cortex is. And then the primary visual cortex will process those informations by having the neurons fire uh, electric signals and the different neurons will have different uh, firing intensities and then there's some magical combination of computation that's happening in this part of the brain so that it is able to identify whatever is an image to the meaning of that image. the the cup or a water bottle or computers or whatever that is right so can we have some some connections can we have a thing that's in the middle and we can forecast through uh through this uh neural net and then how, how can we use the computer to simulate that and the answer is easy right we just wire up all the different kinds of the connections uh, so each connection here is just a way that uh you uh computer forecast 
through this network and this network and uh, the kind of function that you selected that you previous previously think okay this architecture may be useful uh, easier to solve my task and then uh you just train this network with back back propagation um so you would say okay let's put a coffee mug there and then if it predicts it's a car you just uh optimize the loss so you compute for example if in this case uh the prediction is a car and what but you actually want a coffee mug then you will uh compute a loss that's uh a loss that uh, identifies how wrong are you and then that back uh, and then it takes the derivative of that loss with respect to all the connections uh, that you defined previously in your network. And then you change that weight, that connection in the middle by a little bit uh, every time you see a new image. And then the network will, send, uh, will gradually converge to a point where it's able to always get your prediction right. And then the understanding and the intelligent emerges inside of these things, which is kind of amazing. So machine learning have been used in many different areas. And in this case, just, uh, uh, translation and in the case before it was uh, image recognition. And in this case, it's just, so each of these boxes are uh, all the connections, the things that have uh, hidden layers of the neural net. And this, this network is kind of special. It wires up so that it's able to. Uh, so the top row there is uh, Chinese, and then it's the wanted to translate that sentence into English. So it is able to identify a point that okay, after each uh, segment of the word, it's it's able to identify the actual meaning corresponding to it. In that case, so in the the Chinese, it's like. Uh, the, the Chinese uh, sentence is 知识就是力量, and is able to identify 知识 is knowledge. After propagating through E0 and E1, it's able to identify, okay, here the meaning of this sentence have a, have a stop, and then I want to translate this part of the sentence, and then I want to move forward. This is trained entirely by back, back propagation. And so the first two, zhi shi, translate into knowledge. Jiu shi will be translated to this. And li liao is translated to power. And that's amazing that what a neural network, just trained by minimizing errors, can do. But today we're thinking about, so this just replacing traditional programming with uh, what we have neural networks right now to uh, accomplish this kind of task. And okay, and now we get a pretty good understanding about how can we learn from data? How can we learn from patterns? How can we, and now let's think about how can we make the robot to actually plan through a sequence of actions to accomplish some goal, to achieve some goal. And people have really done that in long, long time ago, really before machine learning have come over, uh, uh, come around. So this is 1999, uh, uh, 1996. A computer program called Deep Blue uh, just just used database search, and then uh, basically just uh, backtrack search into the chessboard to beat a human. Uh, uh, who is the champion in the game of chess. And this is, there, it, it really doesn't contain any pattern recognition. It's just lots of boards that's been played uh, like more, very frequently in many of the games. And then Deep Blue just store that board into the database and then have it indexed into whatever game that's played and then, uh, try to figure out uh, and then just index into it, index into the database, find the board, and then it sees what's going ahead and then just recursively doing that 
search into the board and then try to see, uh, okay, uh, if I can uh, win the game or is the current board uh, advantage for me and try to, uh, during the search, try to minimize the advantage of the of your opponent and then you can win the game. And people have done that really, uh, really well. And But something very hard uh, in computer science, very, very often occur, uh, occurring in many kinds of fields is that uh, the complexity of things are sometimes just enormous. So this is a game called Go. And then the combinations of Go boards is so much larger than the atoms of the universe. You, can you enumerate all that? Uh, and then you search through all that. Sure you can, but it's gonna take forever. So how, how the AlphaGo beat uh, Lee Sido in uh, 2016? Let's see how we play the game go. So we look at the board, we think, okay, maybe on um, like left side of the region is uh, the place to play. And maybe if I play here, the en enemy or the opponent will take advantage of me and uh, minimize the probability that I can win. And so maybe I want to look at this area first and then I search, have a recursive search uh, in, in my mind inside of this area and exactly um so how did we get the feeling that we want to play on the left side it's, it's kind of weird how do we know like when you play chess I, I see you see okay this guy might want to move here some kind of feeling right and that feeling is kind of kind of similar to when we look at the mug, it's a mug. So we can do, so we can use a neural network for that. So this entire thing on the left is just image. And you can do the same thing as you do in image recognition. However, the object objective in this case will be a little different because you're not like recognizing, or is it a go board or chess board? That's not a problem. The problem right now is what is the region that you want to play? Or what is what are the uh, places that more possibly you want to play? So we pass through this go, uh, go board into a neural net. The neural net says push stone and then at, at some point, and then we do that. However, things are like not really that in uh, AlphaGo because uh, you want to, so uh, obviously in, in, uh, in Go, you can search for a uh, couple, couple of steps and then you can, uh, so you have the compute, you need to do that, that's, that's of course, but you want to know, like for example, if you are uh, doing a tree search inside of that, you want to know which are the nodes that you want to expand first, right? So you cannot just, randomly select one that it, it expands it. It's really likely that so many places that you can play on there, most of, most of them are, are just not gonna make, let you win. So you really want to look at and search whatever region that's interesting, that's meaningful for you to win the game. And so we, maybe we want to predict something else or having a different kind of objective and uh, image recognition. So, the, but the rough idea is kind of simple, uh, right, kind of similar to uh, what we have in uh, image recognition. We have a data set, we image, uh, we imitate human behaviors and... Okay, let's say I'm the goal player and then I'm the best uh, human goal player. And then I teach the robot to play. Is it possible? For example, let's say I, I'm always uh, I will I will only play with a robot when I'm really energetic. So 
there's no problem that I am uh, uh, not uh, executing all my greatest moves, uh, doing my best job at playing the game. Let's uh, ignore all that. Let's say I can play at my best like, all the time with the robot. And I also, at the same time, teach the robot to play. So for, for example, the last will be some kind of uh, loss that's between what move I did and what move the robot did. And the robot have this neural network inside of it. And then you optimize the loss. That's okay, how different is my move and robot's move and then let the robot imitate you. It, right? Is it gonna work? Um, or what's the problem here? Why? Yeah. How will uh, you know that you've represented like the full search tree or whatever, like all of the, the key number of games that you play with the robot, you can only play one game at a time. Let's say I can play game. infinite amount of games with the robot in no time. Okay. Uh, so the robot, can learn everything, perfectly replicate all my moves. It can only be as good as you. Exactly, exactly. So the robot will never outperform. That's not what we want, right? We want, we don't want to, we don't want the robot just to learn what my behavior is. That's not the intention of having this machine learning algorithm. The intention is, I want the neural network to tell me what is the best place to play. And I don't really care how do you come up with it. I just really care about how can I win the game and maximize the probability of me winning. That's all I can. Right? So I can be the best human player, but uh, even if it imitates me well, it doesn't matter because there, there's there's possibility that there can be something that's not us uh, play it better. And actually, in reality, human really bad at making decisions, right? So you, you see four or five crashes every day because you you're driving the car and then you're texting all the time and then you're listening to music and maybe that's not worse than somebody. Uh, Get distracted all the time and then how the hell do you know that okay i should be pressing the, the gas now or why uh, why should be pressing break now it's really unclear that we're making the best decisions and that th bad decision sometimes could lead to very bad uh, situations crashes or maybe injuries that we don't want right so yeah um, we want the machine to do better than us. And humans generally don't know in places where the complexity just hits a very optimal way to do something. It's really hard to come up with that. Um, so how do we learn play go? Let's like set aside the question of how can the machine do better? How did we learn to play some game? We first play it and then we see what's happening in the game. And then we want to achieve some outcomes, but maybe the outcome is not achieved the first time we play it. And that's okay. Nobody plays Go the first time and he's suddenly the master of Go. That's kind of impossible, right? So what we want the machine to do is if it's not able to just search through all the thing and give you the optimal solution, maybe you can learn just like us. Uh, it can just learn how to learn to just play some games, maybe not good games, and then find out what you did wrong and improve on that. It's exactly what we play. So we want, uh, so humans do something, we observe the out outcome in this case, it's just win or lose, and we learn from previous experiences and we try to optimize some kind of utility. So this utility, I mean, some kind of score, some kind of 
rewards, some kind of things that you want to get. And then you iterate through this process. That's what Bicido uh, does. Uh, he played Go from very young, and then he just played it all day, every day, and then become the master of Go. So we want that kind of learning. That kind of learning is actually very well studied in uh, academia. It's called reinforcement, reinforcement learning. And it's a paradigm of machine learning that's uh, involving this sequentially, that's modeling this sequential decision-making into the learning itself. So what we want the machine to do is to do kind of the similar thing, um, take some action, um, but here I, I'm like introducing some new words. So state will be some kind of observation or some kind of situation that you have in the environment currently right now. And then you execute some kind of action, maybe push a stuff. And then you observe something happen. That's uh, after you push the zone, your, your opponent push the zone, and then you see uh, what's the situation now, uh, which is different from before you push this. Okay. And then the policy is basically mean the strategy that you want to plot. So given, given any kind of four configurations, you want to say, uh, I want to play here or play at this region at some probability, or it's defining the probability of actions that you want to play. Uh, given a situation that you're in. And then you want, you want to maximize the probability, in this case, in a goal setting. You want to maximize the probability of you winning the game. That's reinforcement. Yeah, and also we, we want to say uh, some, some, some trivial things that you, know, you, you have to obey the rule of the game. So you cannot just say, okay, uh, something go wrong and I stop playing. That's it's impossible because you need to play till the end of the game to observe uh, who is winning, uh, who, who win, and who. Uh, you need to follow the rule of the game. Uh, every, one stone push uh, uh, each turn, and uh, exactly as the rule set. Um, and then having all that constraints, we want to maximize the objective, which is trying to. Uh, optimized for probability. Why that works, right? Why just a number just saying uh, win or lose can have you come up with intelligent behavior. Intelligent behavior is really just a model of rational decision. So um, you have these three fruits and then the apple, the orange, the very good orange. So, for example, in uh, my fruit, my favorite uh, fruit is the apple and uh, grape. Okay, and maybe I I really don't care about the orange. So, this is my favorite, and a little less favorite, and uh, the things I don't like. Maybe. Um, so, I have a comparison of uh, so if. You, if you come up to me, I have an apple, and then you say, oh, I have an orange, I want to exchange with you. That's impossible for me to do, make that decision. I will not exchange with you because I, I love the apple more than an orange, okay? So, um, so if I have to choose one that's in, inside of these three, I will choose the apple because that's rational decision. I have a number inside my head that's corresponding to each of these things and say, okay, what is the value of that? And what is the value of that? And what is that? So you can say, I love apple more than grapes and grapes more than orange, but somehow I love orange more than apple. That's impossible, right? It's a rational decision. You have a real value reward corresponding to all the kinds of situations that you will encounter in this world. And then you want to maximize it. So maximizing return is really where 
rational decision making and intelligence intelligence emerges. Yeah, so getting to some uh, some details, I, I really don't want to uh, waste the time of uh, talking about all the equations. So I so it's just some basics. So we have a state uh, a go board, and then we play some mesh push a step. This is the place we push, and then the, the stone we push, and then we observe a new board after we push the stone. And, or maybe it can, this can be a humanoid robot standing, and then it decides to move this uh, right leg forward. And then you observe whatever that happens afterwards, maybe fall over, or maybe it's it's go right, and that's how we model this decision making process. It's called Markov decision process. And there's a very uh, important assumption is that uh, this kind of model is really not uh, perfect. So it's kind of saying that oh, I, I know everything that's relevant to my decision making in the state that I'm living in. Um, this is really not uh, uh, some really kind of not possible because uh, you cannot know everything, right? So uh, for example, uh, I, I, I'm facing Aditash right now, and then I, I see Aditash sitting on the chair, and then suddenly I, I rotate maybe 180 degrees. I, okay, I don't know where Aditash is. That's, that's kind of that's kind of wrong, right? I, and I also need to like make some kind of decisions maybe I want to fetch added cash a cup of water, okay? but right now I don't know where added cash is. But added cash happened to have in my side just a couple of seconds ago, and I need to remember that. So this is kind of not modeling the remembering here that's inside of the intelligent agent, but you can actually construct this state so that it can remember something. So you can you can actually uh, purposely construct a state that has some kind of memory that's relevant to the decision making. So if you're in a household setting, you kind of want to remember where people are, right? So you can fetch them a drink, a, a beer, or uh, just maybe when you moving back backwards, not bump into uh, someone that's in the room, right? So um, this is kind of not a perfect modeling, but maybe we can have better modeling, but this is what we have now. So why, why reinforcement learning is interesting? It can, it can solve problems that are so complicated that the search space is just enormous. So this is the game of Dota 2. And uh, this game, the, the artificial intelligent agent Neural networks uh, built by OpenAI. They have had a 320 overwhelmingly uh, win against humans. Uh, and they are the, uh, the world champion. They're the best human in this world to play this game. This game, mobile game, uh, if you play uh, LOL or you, you know how complicated this uh, game is. Sometimes you need to really take like two years, three years, four years just to learn basics. And then if you want to be like a pro, you want to put in so much time uh, just to uh, reinforce and uh, polish your skills, polish all the decision making. And, but the computer can actually just play 100 times, 1,000 times more a game every day. And it doesn't have to eat, doesn't have to sleep, and it doesn't have to rest. So. Uh, and all the and it can play many different games all at once and then learn uh, from all the experiences. So that's kind of powerful. And maybe we can really get uh, intelligence from that. And we did. So uh, so this is uh, so why are we just trying to learn the behavioral policy itself without learning the actual uh, 
model of the world. So Tesla is actually doing uh, their modeling of a three-dimensional environment around it using uh, a scene construction from images and uh, plan through a sequence of actions in that model. So uh, try to avoid uh, crashing into humans. Um, but why we want to learn sometimes we want to learn without the model. It's because sometimes the details of the world, the environment, is not really relevant to your decision. For example, if you're driving on 405 and then suddenly a leaf got blown uh, horizontally and you see the leaf landing on your car. And then it caused a very slight change in the mass of your car. And a very slight change in the handling. So, well, there are two different things you can do. You can uh, try to adjust the kind of action you take here, or you try to actually model that leaf flying uh, uh, in the in the air and then it lands on your car, and then call this a sudden change in the mass of your car. Which one is easier? You can just model that. It's no way. You, you don't really have to change much. Your action. This is actually known. And in 2004, uh, Professor Peter Beale, in his uh, PhD thesis, uh, he looked at how uh, experts do stunt helicopter. So the helicopter can, so the helicopter have a, a like flies like this, right? And the stunt helicopter driver can and do the helicopter like. Uh, upside down, just fly like that. And then it can do like TikTok, like a, you know, it's not an efficient way to uh, to to fly a helicopter, but you can do that. Uh, but that requires really expert control of that helicopter to know what kind of situation you want to pull which lever. And then TikTok is like this, just literally helicopter, have a, have a, I don't know how to say that, but it's just flying like that. And yeah, uh, so what, 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 what Peter found out was that the environment is really complicated. So you have uh, gravity, you have uh, aerodynamics, you have the actual engine of the plane, and you have, you have uh, image observations, you have different kinds of Let's say you have a three dimensional coordinates, that's still really hard. But you can actually figure out the control, the controller of that uh, plane just using a linear class, a linear regression. A linear regression. Just, it just, it's a linear controller just controlling the entire uh, uh, action of the plane. Just use uh, control theory uh, and some kind of learn uh, to actually control that uh, stun helicopter in that way. That's amazing. So sometimes we want to learn uh, just how to control uh, whatever thing that we want to control instead of learning. Uh, but you know, sometimes the model is easy. Let's say go chess. We know we push the stone, what the board, what the board, uh, what the board will be like. So uh, you can just, uh, simulate that in a model based way, but sometimes uh, if you're driving, you really need to collect real world data. So, Tesla collecting all the images, uh, uh, human interventions uh, in, the in a huge data set, and then use that to train the neural network. So, we can um, convert the decision-making pro uh, problem into a prediction. prediction. Um, so let's say we have an oracle that says, okay, I have a function Q that says, okay, in this, in this state, uh, I know that given the action that you can take, I can tell you, you will win or lose. Let's say that's the setting. Um, and then, what you, what you want to do is just, you want to, okay, uh, I will take the action that whatever, uh, 
you tell me I can win, then I'll play the action, right? So maybe we can learn this function with a neural network. And so that we can recover a behavioral policy just to, we forecast the network, we see which action actually maximizes the return, and then we take that action. Um, so don't, um, don't, uh, don't, uh, don't be afraid of this uh, messy equation. It's just saying that, okay, so this is the current uh, value of each action. And the value of each, this action, uh, in this state, this action is going to be whatever the state that I end up in. So I can end up in a possibility of all the next states, but averaging all the values of possible next states I can end up in. And then I plus the one step reward that I get. It's going to be the reward, uh, it's going to be the cumulative return, expected cumulative return that I get from this current state action. And then if I can enforce this relationship all over the decision problem, I have, if I have this cube, uh, I can just recover an optimal policy from it because I can uh, know which action I take can maximize the return that I get. So that's simple. And we want to learn that function from, uh, from data. Uh, the data can be, up, in this case, if you're playing the game, so you're, you're here, you're controlling whatever zero that you're controlling, and then you have some uh, inputs to the computer, and then you, you observe maybe, okay, I have more money than what I had than what I than before, or I have less money, or I have some kind of reward or penalty. And then you observe what is the state that you have afterwards. And that's going to be your data. And notice that there's no label that that's like, okay, you're in this state, and then what's the optimal action that you should take? That's not what it is. It is the job of the neural network to figure out is this action good or not? And even if this action is bad, what can I learn from this action? I can learn from any kind of data, no matter it completes the task, no matter it fails the task, no matter what it does. We're just, we're just learning what will happen if I do this. So if I do this, what will happen? And Q is a kind, of, it's kind of a, you can view it as a bootstrap of the world. You can have a simulator that, that says, okay, here's the state that you, you're going in. And then you, you take some actions and predicts like a, the next state, the, the actually what environment will actually change. But Q is kind of only saying, okay, that's kind of, the, that modeling is complex. Let's, let's not do that. Let's just say, when I take this action in this setting, what kind of return will, will I get? Because that's all I care about, right? All I care about is winning. So I just have a real value uh, number to predict instead of predicting an actual next thing, which is really not uh, sometimes not benefiting your decision making problem. Uh, you, uh, you want to know which action actually leads to good outcomes, so what action leads to bad outcomes. So uh, this is a very concise way uh, to, and an easy way to, for you to learn. So it's just a model, but the model doesn't say what the outcome is. It says how, how much return will it get afterwards. Uh, that's over all possible trajectory that you're going to observe in the future. Yeah, and we have uh, some simple uh, Q learning. The V of S prime is basically saying, what is the value estimate of the next state? What, how, how much, uh, so this is usually in Q learning, you will compute the V by using, by taking a max of the Q function. So you will actually use your Q to predict on the next state and then take a, take a max over all the actions to see, okay, let's say I'm in this state now, and then 
which action gives me the maximum amount of return that I can get. Yeah. Oh, is it doing the artifact the like a continuous action? Like, yeah, like, so, like very good question. Very good question. So I'm act, I'm actually waiting for you on that. So let me actually uh, finish with this one, and then I'll right right after that I will let you know the continuous action. So so if you take the mask over here, so very good question. How do you take the mask and continuous? And let's say we have a discrete uh, action, but for now, but I will talk about the continuous action afterwards. Um, and then you would use that as your estimated value of your next thing. And then this thing will be an estimate of whatever value that's related to the state action that you heard. So this reward and this next state may be noisy, but if you follow what this state action reward next state data is following. Uh, the transition dynamics of the world and it's obeying all the rules of the world so that you sample enough samples and you have enough data to train this thing, uh, it will eventually follow this action that will uh, uh, govern by the rule of the game and what actually what actual uh, you, you will converge to the right solution. So uh, if you have a linear uh, data or if you have a Actually, tabular data, uh, just have a Q value stored in a table. Uh, you can actually have this to be converged, but uh, if it's uh, non linear, like a deep neural network setting, actually, we don't have convergence, but um, you can get uh, good enough to do or you do amazing things like uh, being uh, easy to uh, okay. So, yeah, actually. How do we take the artifacts? That's um, so. Uh, you want to add one Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, we have our, our value estimate as this before. And let's say now the action is continuous and I cannot take the mask. So what I can do, if I have a parameterization that is fully, uh, fully uh, differentiable of a theta, let's say this theta is a neural network and I can uh, freely backpropagate through S and A. So what I can do is I can say, in the policy improvement step, I can fit another thing that's, I can have a, a network that's called mu. Have a parameterization of B, and then it takes in the input of S, and then it spit an output, a continuous action. And uh, the, the output of this thing is A. And so this thing doesn't have any meaning for now, but if you optimize it in a way that's, for example, So you set the next time step of your parameter of the mu network to maximize Q in a continuous way. Uh, so you just, uh, every, you froze the parameter configuration of theta. Uh, you, have, you, uh, you sample a state from your data set, and then you just predict the output, uh, predict the output action of this Fee uh, using this fee network, and then you backpropagate this uh, objective function back all the way to fee, and then you maximize. This is kind of saying that okay, let's have 
let's say the Q is situated like this. And the, the horizontal axis is actually action. So if you take if you take this action, you will get this uh, Q value and this Q value is harm also. Um, what, what this actually saying is, what this equation is saying is that if you're here, if your uh, action after your forward has the mu B of S is here, you want to change this action so that you can move this action a little bit to maximize Q. And then if you do this frequent enough, you will actually move to here, which is the actual max of Q. And then, okay, we have, we, we now maximize Q with this P, uh, with this mu network. And parameterized by p. How do we uh, how do we learn q? Right. So we still learn q by minimizing the uh, temporal difference error, um, which is So we have a target estimate here, and then we want to minimize this thing uh, and the, the loss between this thing and the current state action. Before it's a V or a max over A, right? But now we can just predict, use this to predict, predict what action is we're going to take in the next thing. As prime, mu b of s prime, and then you minimize this one to learn the q, and then you minimize, uh, and then you up, and then you maximize this value to learn mu, and that's how you handle continuous action space. Okay. Does that make sense? Sort of. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if uh. So, so, there, yeah. so you have like another network that, yeah. that, that network acts like a continuous function and like you can get the derivative of the network space between the like, like lines of the, the network. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, um, uh, I, if it doesn't make sense, uh, I'll, I'll continue explaining it uh, after we finish. Okay. That makes sense, okay. Um, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question uh, actually. Um, and Many people, first time they learn this, uh, they don't think about that. But uh, yeah, that's a really good question. So you can recover the policy by either taking an argmax of Q if you're in a discrete action space, or you can just do this to in a continuous action space. That's uh, pretty simple to do. Um, so you also cannot let let the network just take whatever action that it thinks is the best because. Uh, even if you just initialize the network, the network is completely wrong and takes actions that doesn't make any sense. So you want to have, or the the the, the agent may the neural network may be executing some actions and observing some good outcomes, but kind of fading the big picture. Maybe it's sort of like um, so if you uh, uh, you have a due date, uh, you have a due. Uh, this night, and then you're scroll scrolling uh, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and you feel uh, very relaxed. Uh, and then that's that's kind of short term reward. And then uh, you feel that's good. And then if the neural network keeps doing this, it will like fail the due date, uh, uh, the deadline that you have. So um, you want to actually take some random actions to see if that random action can actually give you. Uh, better reward, and then you can learn from that experience because experience is uh, here. All the data is sampled by your behavior policy. Uh, if that policy is bad, you won't get really good examples. And some sometimes, uh, what you want to do is uh, you go into some state space, and then you don't know if you have a good idea of what action to take. Then you take a random action to see what the uh, outcome is, 
And then whenever you take an app random, uh, random action and then you observe something else, that data gets stored into the data set. And then you learn from that data set to optimize your neural network. And then the network takes the action again in the environment and policy improves. So just, just use that, really simple, not uh, just a uh, stochastic gradient descent, optimizing a uh, network. You can get really interesting behaviors. Uh, on, on the left is, I think many people saw this, is the neural network learned to play uh, the game of, of breakout in Atari. And this is a common benchmark. I, I, I use this all the time uh, in, the, in the research. So uh, what it does is sometimes uh, after it plays for a while, it came up with a very interesting strategy. Um, so we find out that you can actually dig a tunnel in the corner to let the ball go to the upper part. And then you don't have to do anything so, so that it, it can uh, actually get you many rewards without you actually need to uh, taking any action. This, this strategy is interesting in a way that uh, the people who design this learning algorithm never know that there's a skill or there's a uh, there's this way like this, you can play this game. The algorithm kind of find out this strategy all by itself, just by playing some random action observe what the outcome is, and then reinforce on that. And then this is what you get, right? It's kind of amazing. And then the robot just, you can, you can, the same algorithm, you can do something as like drastically different. You can teach a, a, a quadrupedal robot to walk. So this is zero minute, the neural network just initialized randomly wired, doesn't know what to do. And just squiggly around, take some random actions because of the exploration is doing. Uh, exploration is telling it uh, to take some random actions, and then this is basically collecting some data. And then after eighteen minutes, you can see that the seemingly random behavior kind of moves in a way that squiggles toward a little bit. When it up observe that the data can give you good outcomes. It tries to take more of that action. And then after it takes more of that action, it can actually move forward a lot faster and a lot smoother without falling over, like, like with the beginning of the flow. This is after 72 minutes of learning. And amazing, right? Yeah, this is after all the training. It's still kind of random because it's really just learned from nothing at all. It collects the experience all by itself from a random policy and then tries to figure out what is a better way to uh, move forward, what is the better way just by maximizing the time. And then it's also able to handle perturbations, which is uh, amazing. So this is the flat ground and you can actually put it on a different kind of surface that it is previously trained and is able to also uh, kind of move forward uh, in, in different settings. The, the reason the researcher actually showed uh, the, the robot move downstairs is because it didn't really could able to move upstairs. So, uh, but uh, research are actually just happening all the time. Uh, we will have robots that can do a lot better than this, maybe just uh, two years, five years from now. And, but just seeing what we already have, it's already quite amazing. And you can also have a fleet. Is able to relatively grasp objects 
a fleet of robots collecting data at the same time. And this is actually exactly what Tesla does, but Tesla is like not using reinforcement learning algorithms. This one is actually using reinforcement learning algorithms, using kind of similar to this algorithm with some uh, slight variations. And then it is able to learn from all that, uh, different policies, different actions collecting. And the data is just state action, reward and next day. And, and that during that transition, you may really not see if you're doing the right thing or not. But after, at the end of the trajectory, some, somewhere in the trajectory, you will see, okay, I actually picked up this object and I got a good reward. And then just by doing this backup, by doing this backup, you propagate the value of that good state to all your previous actions that you had uh, in the decision process. And that generalizes also to unseen trajectories. And then you are able to get a behavioral policy that's able to pick up objects, very complex, uh, different shape, different size objects, In this case, the input is a uh, RGB image from raw image to actions. And there's no uh, LIDAR, no 3D modeling, no nothing. It's just the camera and the neural network and the, and the robot is actually executing the action and click, collect the data. And this is another, uh, this is a Berkeley robot of elimination of tedious tasks at University of Berkeley. Uh, there, so this is actually the robot trying to assemble a toy plane. And this is trial and error. So it will have a reward that says, if you move this part that's near the plane, you get some good reward until you actually inserted that inside, you get a very good reward. And then, uh, but if you're just floating around, you don't get any reward. You execute some, and the reward sometimes can be easy, a lot easier than the actual local motion of the robot to specify from a human perspective. So you can just say, if I inserted it in, uh, correctly, or I move it closer to the plane, uh, you get a good reward. But um, it's the machine's job to figure out what actual uh, angles are you going to rotate and what actual uh, motions that you're going to plan through or, or execute in this model, in this, in this environment to uh, accomplish your task. And this, people have played it, played with this uh, for a long time. And they can, uh, there's some uh, recent research that uh, they they have it in a uh, simulation environment, and they, they actually found out the, the the robot. What the robot does is that. So what the researcher want is like, okay, here's a stack of objects, and you want to put it in, into the bin, and then, but the robot actually thinks a little differently because. Uh, the researchers want okay when you have this uh, when your hand move near the object, it gives you some reward, and then when I actually put put it in the bin, it gives you some reward. But if you do this like too slow, you will get a little penalty because uh, you want to do this as fast as you can. So the robot find out what's actually the best way to do it is just to slam in the rope, slam in the stack of objects, and the objects flies into the bin. And then that's actually the fastest way and the maximum, you get the maximum return. And the researchers never did uh, think about that's actually a solution that you can do, but the robots actually do it pretty well, like a, like a tennis player. It just hits the, hits the object and the hot object shoo, flies into the bin, like magic. <laughs> So
So our world is really just coming back from the from the research progress and everything that we have. Um, our world is still really challenging, really complicated, and we have people risking their lives in different kinds of situations. And can we replace those jobs with robots? And we can have maybe two robots come in and put out fire. And robots can destroy themselves by themselves because it's no no life of the robot is worth of the life of human. So uh, why so much uh, interest and so much hype around all this uh, robot learning thing? Because it gives you some possibilities of a future that uh, very few, few of us have ever imagined that is actually uh, going to be possible. And many things like these uh, tasks you need to manage for the stacks of the uh, uh, items to ship to the customer and you need to do this uh, supply chain job all day is really repetitive. It really doesn't require any spirit or any um, life of a human. We can replace all these boring jobs with a robot. And the robot can actually just do a better job. Um, it doesn't, it will never get tired. If it gets tired, you can just, if it starts to break down, you can just throw it away and get a new one, right? Um, but if a human is doing the job, you, you really can, can do that. You need to care about, um, she is having a boring time doing all these things for you and you really need to care about her health or um, it's really not good for for any of us to have this big happy and I know. And th this is actually what all the products that produced uh, right now. Uh, the masks, the vaccine, a lot of them are automated uh, for sure, but some like details that the robot just cannot get that very cool. We need to have humans still working at the supply chain. So, and it's just not to mention that the firefighters risking the lives. Um, yeah, so we can maybe have something that's better than what we have now, just by uh, making the neural networks work, right? It's a very uh, it's a twist, it's a very small thing, but uh, you can actually accomplish something that's uh, more than uh, what it what it is itself. So the robots you see uh, that can pick up things, they are good, but they're not good enough. They're not good enough so that it is able to robust to all the different complexities that's actually happening in the production environment. So. In the research, you can show that, okay, you can make the robot open a door or that's great. But in the industry setting, in the production setting, you really want the robot to go open the door a hundred times, maybe only failing one or once or twice. That's the level of robustness that you need for the real world. For reinforcement learning systems, a lot of them are not getting that right now. The difference of reinforcement learning and label data imitation is that it is able to get rid of the process of actually a human go, go coming in, see what's the data and, and label it. And that really limits how much data can you have for the neural network. So the current uh, reinforcement learning problem is how can you stably learn the neural network? The neural network is quite unstable to learn and requires lots of different, uh, lots of expertise in the hyperparameter tuning and all the nitty gritty details. So how can we have, uh, if we have an algorithm that is stable to learn just a few function uh, from the data, you can actually uh, have uh, much more capability, much more, much higher possibility that you can, uh, because you will get a lot more data than uh, a traditional supervised learning, for example. Uh, the uh, so I 
I'm not criticizing Tesla. Tesla is doing great. Tesla is doing vision all for their cars. However, their vision system is now still needs kind of some labeling. The labeling can be done by a human or it can be done by an automatic labeler. So for example, the softwares that you are not able to execute in uh, that small amount of time at inference time when the car is actually driving, you can actually use those tools to label the data and then let the uh, let the neural network to learn from the data and then when you actually deploy on the car is the neural network and the neural network does inference at a very small amount of time uh, and very high uh, quality prediction. Uh, so the, the the labeling part we can really get rid of that from the RL because RL is there's no label the label is the reward and the reward can be get a lot easier than the label because uh, if, if, if you're labeling what the mo movement is, is that you need to say, okay, the wrist need to turn uh, 10 degrees and then your uh, right shoulder should move forward maybe uh, uh, 20 centimeters and it's hard to label, right? But the reward you can really get from maybe. So whatever you does, so it so what it can obtain is that if I want to train a policy that's I can pick up this charter. I can just have uh, a, a weight measure uh, under the table. So when I pick up this thing, the the weight the weight goes away, and then the weight will assign a reward as a good reward. Uh, and then if this thing is still on the table, that is like it's like done automatically, and it's labeled automatically. It's actually just part of the observation itself. Um, so, but current reinforcement learning have many other different challenges. Like, so uh, if uh, so the mistake for uh, for fixing the uh, robot uh, is pretty high, and then uh, you really need to get the ninety nine point nine nine. You really care about how many nines you can get, because if you have one mistake that the robot made, it may be very costly to just fix up that. So if you, if the robot actually made uh, one mistake every hour, you really need a human to just sit next to it and then monitor the robot. But why don't just let the human do the, do the job? Not, not why, what is the point of having a robot? So right now the robustness is really not good. And then, uh, and. The, the exploration, exploitation, the trial and error learning is really not happening in many scenarios. For example, self driving can really not uh, let it crash into highway and then say, okay, it's a bad reward. No, that's, that's, that's not going to happen because you cannot risk the life of humans on the car. And also, the learner doesn't really quite know um, what is the scenario that they haven't seen before. So the action should be taken cautiously. It's really a neural network. So when you observe anything that's out of the distribution of your training data, you really don't know what to do. And the current systems, many of them don't know that, and they just execute some random matches. And that can be very deadly in uh, many scenarios, uh, deadly to, a, to the robot itself or deadly to human, which is really bad. And we also don't have like reversibility where so the robot doesn't know like some of the actions if you take there's some serious consequence that you will never recover and if it doesn't pay attention to those edge cases it's really able to really easy to fail because uh, let's say just uh, you have only one percent of your time you will actually face this reversibility issue and then you, but if you run your uh, robot long enough, or maybe just a couple of hours, you will encounter one of those uh, reversibility issues, and then your robot just stop working. So, and human needs to come in and fix all that. It's a mess. So, lots of challenges, but still people are still moving forward trying to make this thing work because uh, if, if it works, the world will be a different place.
and the world will be a lot better place to do it. Thank you. Uh, do, do we still have some time for questions? Or 